This is Miles Socorro, but we call him Spider. Except if you're Kiri. If you're Kiri, you call him Monkey Boy. In order to better understand Spider and why he makes the decisions that he makes, we have to start by asking ourselves the question, how did Spider enter the chat? Like, what kind of love affair went down that spawned Spider into the world? Well, that would be due to this very dysfunctional relationship between no one other than a uh, certified mean person, Colonel Miles Korich, and RDA Scorpion pilot, Paz Socorro. They met, they got busy, and then they gave birth to the first human ever born on Pandora. And then they just like never talk to each other again. Paz was apparently a very loving mother towards Spider. She even kept this picture of him on her dashboard when going into battle. Courage, on the other hand, peaced out real quick as he goes on to admit. Enough to know that... Uh... Well, he wasn't always the best father. Implying that Quaritch number one was a very absent father in the brief time that he knew Spider. But the one thing that the parents had in common was that they both died uh, while fighting the Na'vi on August 23rd, 2154. Specifically during the assault of the Tree of Souls or the Battle of the Tree of Souls, whatever we're calling it nowadays. Actually, there's one more big thing they have in common. Uh, and that was the fact that they were both killed by Neytiri. As Neytiri was most likely the one uh, to shoot the arrow through Paz's cockpit window, and Neytiri is definitely confirmed to have hit Quaritch with two arrows, thus ending both of them. After the battle was won and the bad humans were sent back home, they couldn't allow Spider to go back to Earth because babies couldn't be shipped through cryostasis. So they had no other option but to leave him on Pandora with the traitors and the Na'vi. The orphan boy Spider was raised by Nash and Mary McCosker. We don't really know a lot about them other than their brief appearance in the comics, but you can see Nash right here at the beginning of The Way of Water when Spider is chaos chaotically running through the science lab. And I'm just gonna assume that this is Mary. But wait a second. If Mary and Nash were Spider's adoptive parents, then why do we only see them in this short clip right here? Why aren't they in the rest of the way of water? Why don't they check up on Spider? That's a really good question, Bryce. Thanks, Bryce. But before I answer that, we're gonna talk about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. As you're about to learn in this video, sometimes it's hard being a human on an alien planet, but sometimes it's hard being a human on a human planet. So whether you're dealing with them big issues or just going through a rough patch, BetterHelp over here is providing the world's largest therapy service that is 100% online. When using BetterHelp, the, the thing that we're currently talking about, you can explore a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. BetterHelp's goal is to make therapy more affordable and accessible. The accessibility is really appealing because as some of you may know by now, finding a therapist near you, or sorry, finding the right therapist near you can be a challenge, to say the least. To get started, all you got to do is fill out this questionnaire that looks like this, so they can match you with a very personalized therapist from their network. Then once you got matched, you can talk to your therapist over text, call, video, etc. Just whatever you feel comfortable doing. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule meetings whenever. And let's say you get to the point where you're like, you know what, I don't feel like my current therapist is, you know, doing it for me. Well, you know what? there's no need to worry because you can switch to a completely new therapist with no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you're getting the same professionalism and quality that you would get from an office therapy. But on top of that, you're getting a therapist that is custom picked for you, more scheduling flexibility and more affordable prices and, and, and more reasons. You can get 10% off your first month by clicking on this link in the description below. So go check out BetterHelp today and see if they can help you. Anyway, back to the McCoskers. Nash and Mary were scientists, both on the side of protecting the Native population. Choosing the side of the Na'vi had to do with their principles and love for Pandora, so the couple remained on the moon. And oh boy, were they incredibly patient and understanding with the Na'vi. And for once, I'm not being sarcastic. After all, they were on the side of the Na'vi during the war, and they wanted to make sure Pandora remained a free place for them. However, in order for the rest of the humans living at Hell's Gate to survive, they needed to mine more resources from the ground. But the humans got a lot of resistance from the Na'vi anytime they tried to do something. When we see the McCoskers not long after 2154, Mary is exhausted and Nash is in constant rage mode. From their perspective, the Na'vi weren't willing to meet them halfway and prevented any essential development for the human settlement. There was also this one time where Jake was accidentally poisoned because Sute's brother threw a poison blade at Jake and then Jake caught it with his bare hands and then he got poisoned. It's a very long story. But when Jake was poisoned and dying and all that, 
what needed someone to get the antidote from a cave. But the cave's opening was so small that not even a Navi child could fit through it. Moa even claims that she didn't want to risk a child's life, implying that she's unwilling to let a Navi go down there. But she's willing to let a human go down there and sacrifice themselves, causing another point of contention. Nash and Mary reluctantly agree to get this special plant. And after they risk their lives to get this antidote, Nor, Max, and the rest of the Navi don't even thank the McCoskers. And from the moment the RDA was sent home to the moment they returned, they were slowly getting pushed to their breaking point. Then fast forward to the year 2168. The humans return to Pandora and General Francis Ardmore sends Hell's Gate a transmission claiming that if any of the humans come back to the RDA and return to work, they would be granted amnesty. Like the RDA would just completely forget about everything. Jake was wanting to fight off the humans while Mary and other scientists were claiming that they're not guerrilla fighters. In fact, a lot of people agreed with that statement, as more than 50% of the on-world humans ended up accepting the general's offer. And guess which couple decided to accept the general's offer? It was the freaking McCoskers, that's who. Nash's reasoning was that him and Mary had kids and they wanted to keep them safe. Something that Jake can actually empathize with because he ends up abandoning the same group of people slash Navi for the same exact reason. We don't know what happened to Mary or Nash when they surrendered to the RDA. And during Avatar The High Ground Volume 3, this SecOps soldier gets hit by an arrow when other Navi step in to protect the Sullys who are being chased by the invading humans. And a lot of people think this is Nash. We know from Courage himself how deadly these arrows can be. They're fond of arrows, dipped in a neurotoxin that'll stop your heart in one minute. So if this is Nash, uh, he is definitely done -zo. I will admit, this, uh, this man and Nash look very similar, but I seriously doubt that it's him. Mind you, this action scene with the SecOps chasing the Sullys happened right after the RDA relanded on Pandora, so I highly doubt that the RDA would give uh, Nash, a scientist who's been a traitor for the past 14 years, a scale suit, a very new piece of technology for the RDA, so that they can send him in with the scale suit squad uh, to chase the Sullys. So Nash is probably alive right now. Anyway, Kiri and Spider bond over the fact that that they're both orphans who never met their biological parents. Well, except for Kiri, she met her biological mother, but her biological mother is basically a vegetable at this point. Spider also held on to a relic from his mother as he taped this picture of Paz to his ceiling above his bed when he was living with the McCoskers. It's kind of nice how they both held on to these photos of each other. Kiri refers to Spider and herself as war orphans. She also says stuff like Spider is the brother she never had, even though she already has two. The next person uh, Spider is closest to would be the Loak. The two of them bond over the fact that they're very underappreciated and undervalued. And Spider and Tuke are pretty close too. Spider isn't too close with Nateum, which is why Nateum was kind of reluctant to save Spider, as he doesn't really consider him a part of the Sullys. This is most likely due to Nateum's close relationship with his mother and father. As Jake is also indifferent towards Spider, and Nateri just straight up hates him. Mom, poor snake. However, Spider does have a friendly enough relationship with Nateum that he feels as if he can taunt the golden child when he's getting patched up. Oh! Aww. Wanna kiss on the boo-boo? Oh, and Spider has a very close relationship with Dr. Uncle Norm Spellman and Max Patel underrated hero. Okay, apparently the list of uh, the people Spider is cool with does not end here, as him and Mawat also have a pretty solid relationship too. Because unlike her daughter Neytiri, Mawat isn't harboring this blind hatred towards all humans. She understood the value of teaching Jake Sully their way of life in 2154, and even when Home Tree was burning, Mawat still had the rationale to believe that Jake and Dr. Augustine could still help them, which they did. So I'm glad to know that Mawat is cool with the humans, who are cool with the Navi. She is such a good leader. A lot of people are comparing Dances with Wolves to Avatar, which is a fair comparison, but Spider is the embodiment of the title Dances with Wolves. Even though he had Nash and Mary, he never saw them during the day because he was out there in the world of Pandora hanging with the Sully children as Neytiri uh, judged from afar. So Spider is the closest any human ever got to becoming Omatikaya. Well, besides Jake. I mean, Spider fully adopted their lifestyle. He has the proper respect for the world around him. He's fluent in the Navi language. He's an excellent climber, a remarkable hunter. He's rocking an Omatikaya armband with forest leaves on it. He has his own Omatikaya knife and bow, but because of his size, he has to wield an Omatikaya children's bow. The same kind of bow that baby Neteum is using right here. Also, Spider hisses like the Navi when he feels threatened. <laughs> 
and he even learned the Pandoran foods that he can eat so that he can eat with the Sullies and the Omatikaya. In order to better blend in with his surroundings, Spider paints himself blue with Spartan fruit dye, doing an okay job of emulating the tiger stripes of the Na'vi. And this way, he will avoid Awa's immune response. Seriously, and the animals respect me more. They don't think of me as human. Something the RDA spent an unreasonable amount of money and resources on in order to bypass. Spider's pretty tall too. He's six feet, so he's pretty close to the height of Luwak and Kitty, but he's more close to the height of someone like Took. But even after all of that, Spider is still not part of the Omatikaya. Instead, he's left with the average burdens that a normal human being has to carry, like your father being a war criminal who decided that one day he wanted to wipe out the entire race of the Na'vi, as well as having to carry an exopack all the time. Because without a mask, Spider could only breathe Pandoran air for about like two minutes before unaliving himself, so he's been stuck using this Gen 1 exopack breather unit for his entire life. Even though someone like Jake claims that Spider is more Pandoran than himself, Spider has no chance of becoming an Omatikaya warrior. The biggest and most important reason would be that he's a human. Also, Spider wouldn't even be able to complete the rites of passage that an Omatikaya warrior has to go through. He would definitely die from the poison that would need to be injected into him during Dream Hunt, and he wouldn't be able to uh, do Ikni Maya because he's lacking a neural cue, and wouldn't be able to connect with a banshee, and would definitely lack the strength to take on a full-grown Ikran. At times, Jake Sully may feel like he himself is playing pretend, but Spider is actually left playing pretend, even though Neytiti, Spider's favorite person on the entire planet, believed that he should be with his own kind. Spider believed that he was with his own kind. He may be a human, but at heart, he's an Avi. Which sucks, because he's fiercely loyal to the Na'vi and the Sullies. When the general was trying to extract information from him using that one machine that we're going to talk about in my RDA Explained video, he had peeking all over his prefrontal cortex like Kiri after connecting to the spirit tree, and was going through absolute hell, but gave up nothing. He would rather die than give up his people. And yes, for those wondering, Spider is definitely aware of how much Neytiri hates him. When in the lab looking at old video logs from 2154, Spider claims that Neytiri is wanting to bite his head off. Kiri claims that Neytiri uh, loves Spider, but then again, she is way more optimistic than most. Neytiri and Spider have a history. I would be lying if I said they didn't. Neytiri hated Spider since the day he was born, and Spider gradually grew this resentment towards Neytiri over time. Before the events of Avatar The Way of Water, Jake defended Spider when Neytiri was trying to put him on blast, as Jake claimed that Spider shouldn't be held accountable for the sins of his father. This is something Neytiri completely ignored, as she continuously excluded Spider from family events like saying thanks to Ewa. Kiri, however, protected Spider and claimed that he was part of the family, and made sure that they had him participate in this family stuff. Neytiri's hatred towards Spider pushed Spider to the point where he had this like small outburst, claiming Lawak, Tuk, and Kitty are the only family he has left because of Neytiri's war. Saying that directly to Neytiri's face. We're just scratching the surface here, people. So on the sinking sea dragon, when Spider sees Neytiri in full rampage mode, he is definitely fearing for his life. Because even though he's not really a threat to her, Spider has been reminded for his entire life, that Neytiri views him as no different from any of the other humans, including the humans that just eliminated her son. When the RDA decided to go round two on Pandora, Jake and Neytiri took the Valkyrie shuttle up to intercept the 10 human ships, as they were attempting to stop the RDA from returning. Before this, the Omatikaya and all the friendly humans evacuated to High Camp. Spider was reluctantly left with the McCoskers at Hell's Gate, as Nash and Mary decided to be little traitors and chose the side of the RDA. During this, Nash was in communication with the general, and as he was securing Hell's Gate, he ended up locking Spider in the ambient room. Lawak, Neytiri, and Took actually ended up going back to Hell's Gate to rescue Spider, but they got locked in a bio lab by Nash and other people who turned on the Na'vi. Something that I love from this comic is that Spider uses the fire extinguisher to break out of the room he was locked in, which is probably what gave him the inspiration to use the fire extinguisher to crash the sea dragon in the way of water. When Jake and Neytiri get back from being in space, they meet up with the kids in the forest, and they were all being chased by the RDA. After evading scorpions, amp suits, and the hellhounds, Jake took a moment to tell Spider that he had to stay back, because even though Spider admittedly is in excellent health for a human, he still couldn't come with them, as he would be unable to keep up. So Jake wanted Spider to wait until things quiet down, and then have him head back to the humans to turn himself in. For the one millionth time, Neytiri tells Spider that he belongs with his own kind, but Kiri continues to relentlessly 
endlessly fight for Spider and claims that he's coming with them. In this moment, Spider also tells off Jake and says that he may not be blue, but he belongs here as much as Jake does, throwing some well-deserved shade as he's pointing out that Jake is also part human. Jake, understanding the logic, gives in and reluctantly tells Spider that he can come with him. This gives us some insight into Jake's mindset during Avatar The Way of Water, which is why Jake wasn't in panic mode when Quaritch and other recoms captured Spider and brought him to Bridgehead City. Jake was always under the mindset that if the RDA ever captured Spider, he would be fine because he's 16 and he's also a human. After Spider was taken, Jake reassured his family that the humans weren't going to harm Spider, which is why Sully's, like Kiri, didn't really fear for Spider's life after they got separated. But the thing that did make Jake go into full panic mode was that Spider knew their whole operation. He knew the location of the Sully's and High Camp, and the RDA would clearly extract this information from him, which they did attempt to do. So Spider ended up being the reason as to why the Sully's had to ditch the Omatikaya. Regardless of the Sully's being in danger, Spider teaches Quarge in the way of the Omatikaya by instructing him on how to do things like say Oinati Kame or I see you. And over time, Spider gets Korich to step down from his trigger happy uh, villain phase. Like how he convinces him to not kill the uh, spiritual leader of one of the Oceanic clans. I guess you could say Korich is getting significantly better. I'm coming for you when I do, I'll kill your whole family. Okay, well, I mean, Spider gets him to improve a little bit. I don't know, let's just settle on that uh, Spider was able to spark this change within Quaritch. Spider got him started on this path of not being a one-dimensional villain with zero empathy. But while there's this internal conflict happening with Quaritch, Spider getting reunited with his uh, not da dad, but not dad, ignited an internal conflict in him as well. Spider is not starting to empathize with the humans, but he is starting to care about someone who is fighting for the humans. This is well represented by the fact that Spider carries around an RDA folding blade on top of his amber blade. This one that you see right here. Like Jake Sully, Spider is breaking the third law of Awa, which is normal or use the metals of the ground. And on top of that, the spider's uh, blade is made from amber, and so are the beads on his armband. A good contrast with the blue of the Na'vi. The spider watching Jake say, I kind of hoped you'd say that. And then proceed to uh, demolish his father does not paint Jake in a good light. The spider also witnessed Neytiti uh, shoving two arrows through his father's chest, something that didn't help her case in the slightest. And I'm just going to make the educated guess and assume that Neytiti holding Spider as hostage while threatening to kill him definitely didn't help their relationship like at all. Like it definitely made things worse. So I feel like there's an opportunity for Spider to grow resentment towards Jake in the future and toss him aside the same way that he did with Korich or Nash. But then again, even though Korich changed a bit, Spider still witnessed him uh, burning Navi villages, aiding in the hunting of Tulkun, putting his family in danger. Oh yeah, and there's also the fact that uh, Korich and his recoms are responsible for the death of Neteum. So maybe he's gonna end up sticking with Jake. Who's to say? Some could say that Spider only saved Quaritch because he was trying to make things even after Quaritch ended up protecting him. But there's clearly something more going on. When leaving the Omatikaya, the new old awaked on Tarsum gives Jake a scar that's symbolic of his death as a leader. When receiving this wound, Jake says that a leader must die so that a leader can be born. Spider receives the same kind of wound from Neytiri later in the film. As Neytiri says, Son for son. As you know by now, Jake has been reluctant to take on on Spider as a son for basically the entire time he's known Spider. But Spider has proven himself nothing but loyal. And in the end, Spider helps give Jake a tactical advantage in order to get Kitty and Took back from Korich. After Neteum's death, Jake recites the line, a son for a son, losing his son Neteum, but embracing Spider as his new son, making Spider officially part of the Sully family. Earlier in the film, Jake claims, oh, father protects what gives him meaning. If he is truly viewing Spider as a son right now, he is going to protect him and fight for him. So I honestly think we're going to end up seeing Quaritch and Jake fighting over Spider's love. So I think it would be absolutely amazing if in the third movie, Jake and Quaritch are fighting to be Spider's dad, and then Nash just bursts through the door randomly out of just nowhere, and is all like, not if I have anything to say about it. But that probably won't happen, because Nash f***ing hates Spider. Spider.